My name is Dr. Thomas Joseph, course instructor for our C215 Operations Management course. Welcome to this, uh, I want to call extensive um, video. Um, in, this, in this presentation, we are going to look at the course competencies. That is, we will identify each of the six competencies for the course. And we will also identify each of the objectives or the topics that you are being tested on in our C215 objective assessment or the final assessment for the course. This will help provide some very good information and perspective into the different competencies, what they entail, as well as the different objectives um, in reference to what am I being tested on for the exam so that you know what you need to study and review in preparation for the exam. Uh, so welcome and, and I hope this will be very informative. It might be a little bit um, lengthier than a regular three minute video, but we want to dive deep into those competencies and objectives to ensure that we're providing relevant information that will help you as a student prepare for your objective assessment and the hope is to pass on your very first attempt. So um, a couple of things I want to kind of address as we before we get into the, the heat of everything. Um, number one, we will in identifying the objectives for each competency, we have color coded um, some of those objectives and the, the colors we use are green, yellow, and red. Um, when a, when a compete on an objective rather is identified or color coded as green, this means that students are doing very well in that particular objectives, objective. Majority of the students are, are, are um, meeting the, the requirement, the competency requirement for that objective. If an objective is color coded yellow, it means kind of like the yellow light, right? So there is some students are doing well and some are not doing well. Um, so it's a bit of a challenge um, objective to some students. And then if we call an objective that's coded red, it simply means that this is an area that students are struggling. So you are as a student entering in the course, or probably you've already started working in the course, more than likely you may be a student that has even already taken the objective assessment of the course and did not do well. Um, so we want you to recognize those, those three color coded um, objectives so that you understand, okay, so what are the challenges am I entering into with the material? What are areas that students struggle that I really need to pay attention so that I don't end up struggling in that area as well? And that's kind of what I wanted to highlight um, at the beginning so you understand um, when you see something is coded red, it's an, it's an identification to you that, okay, this is an objective that I really need to pay close attention to, must ensure that I study the required material for. Now, this is not an indication that if an objective shows green or coded green that you don't have to study it, or if it's coded yellow, you don't have to study it. The important thing is to understand where the challenges are in reference to the material to prepare you for the objective, the final objective assessment for this course, what are the areas of challenges that students who have taken this exam um, or data is showing a bit of a struggle? All right, so let's jump right into it. Uh, as I said, this will be probably a, a lengthier video than normal, but let's just get right into it. We look at different things and make sure that you have sufficient information uh, from there on. All right, so the first competency we want to look at is quality management methods. The objective of this quality says the graduate applies quality management methods for continuous improvement in an organization. Um, this competency comprises of chapter five and chapter six. I will talk about this in a little bit. 
and it makes up 16% of the assessment. Remember, your objective assessment comprises of 70 questions. You might see 75 because there are some test questions that our development team is working on, but your grade is based on 70 questions. So 16% out of 70, 16% out of 70 questions, we're thinking roughly about 11 questions. So you more than likely will get 11 questions from chapter five and chapter six. Chapter five is total quality management. Um, so let's talk a little bit about total quality management. So the concept of total quality management has to do with the entire organization engaged in quality management. If we think of quality management from a historical perspective, we get the impression of um, certain departments and organizations were set up to work quality, to work defective products. So essentially, the idea of quality management was only um, directed to that quality department. As a matter of fact, um, in essence, this was the department that should be concerned about quality in the organization, right? That's when we think of it historically. So the idea of total quality management or TQM came about to say, okay, quality management is not just the responsibility of that department or the departments that are working defective products, but it's actually the responsibility of the entire organization. So that's where the, the term total was added before quality management, okay? Just to create some perspective on that. Um, and so it deals with the entire organization is focused on quality. And then there is the connotation of continuous improvement. When you study the philosophies of total quality management from chapter five, you will learn all those things as well. So think with me for a moment about quality, right? When we think of quality, we think of it in terms of words, expressions, right? Um, and so we have, for example, you might go to, uh, let's say a restaurant, and you will say, that service was very good. That service was excellent. That is your way of measuring the quality of the service that you receive or the type of service that you receive. You expressed it in verbal terms, right? Chapter six introduces us to statistical quality control, which means that we were moving a slightly away from the expression of quality to the calculation of quality. In essence, statisticians such as the quality gurus you will see in chapter five, Dr. Duran, Dr. Deming, um, and various others, what they've done is says, okay, now we need to quantify quality. So we go from qualifying quality, such as this was an excellent service, um, this was great service, this was super quality service, to so now let's put a number to that service. So for example, you might be looking, for, you might be going on vacation with your family or just friends or by yourself, and you wanna get a hotel, right? You're looking for a hotel, you might look for a five-star hotel. That's where that comes in. So five-star or the stars that are aligned to that hotel is basically the qualified um, responses of customers that has now been quantified to a star, three out of five, which kind of represents some sort of statistics. We think of statistics, we think of calculations, we also think of it in terms of math, right? So that's why we run into those things in math. So um, the idea of statistical quality control in chapter six has to do with how do we quantify quality? And that's why there's two chapters aligned with this objective quality management methods, right? This is just to help create some perspective into the chapters and how they align with the competency as well. So last thing I wanna talk about chapter six, statistical quality control is the idea of control. The term control does not represent what we generally think of control 
in our everyday lives. I, I would say something like, don't control me, right? Kind of like, don't tell me what to do. Let me make my own decisions. So um, in management too, we see one of the characteristics or the role or responsibility of a manager is to manage and also to control, to analyze and so on and so forth. So the term control in statistical quality control does not have or carry that connotation. The term control carries the, the, the concept of what the organization will accept or reject or accept or not accept, right? So for example, um, you probably have been in this situation or have, have seen that happen. Um, imagine for a moment you went to, I like to use restaurants uh, as example. You went to a restaurant and then you had a very poor service from your waiter or your waitress, whichever. Um, but the service was just horrible. The way the person spoke to you, the way the person, the, the individual treated you, and you just wasn't feeling the vibes. This just didn't kind of resonate well with you. And then you more than likely said to her, hey, can I, can I talk to your manager? Or do you have a manager available that I can talk to? And then you expressed to that manager and said, told the manager how that person treated you, how the person talked to you, how you were not satisfied with the service, all right? The manager will more than likely respond in something, in something like this. This type of behavior is not acceptable. Here at this restaurant, we don't treat our customers that way. That's unacceptable. And I am sorry, I will deal with, uh, I will talk to my employee about it. What did I say? This type of behavior is not acceptable. That's what control is. We don't provide that type of service. Our service has to be excellent. It has to be superb, right? That's what quality, statistical quality control, the idea of control represents. So when you study in chapter six and you see things like quality control charts or quality control tools rather, the idea of control there has to do with um, the different charts or diagrams or tools, quality tools that can be used to help uh, uh, an organizational manager determine what can we accept and what will we not accept. Okay, so that gives us a very good background on what these two chapters um, entail for our quality management methods competency. So things you need to know from chapter five, and when I talk about the objectives, this is what I was referring to. So as you can see in chapter five, we have three top, four topics, three green and three and one yellow. This is an indication that um, the yellow is an area that students tend to struggle a little bit, not too much. Some are doing well, some aren't doing well. So this is an area to pay very close attention to. Um, we talk about the seven quality tools or seven quality management tools. Be sure that you know that in your textbook, this is discussed under um, the, the philosophy of quality management. This is one of the topics on there, but it's further described in the use of quality tools. So you're looking in chapter five for the topic use of quality tools and take note of how each of these tools are discussed and described in the text where there are examples to explain those, pay very close attention to those examples. Um, you also need to review the philosophy of total quality management. Don't just simply look at the table that summarizes those, those philosophies, but take a look on how each of those philosophies are explained in the text as well. You will also be required to look at quality standards for an organization. That has to do with ISO 9000, ISO 14, 14,000 that has to do with the Malcolm Bridge, right? All of those stuff. So make sure you are taking a look at those, um, understanding what ISO 9000 represent, ISO 14,000, what these concepts represent as well. And then be sure to review total quality management across the organization. How does total quality management fit in finance, in accounting, in human resource, in information systems or IT? Take a look at that. These are topics that are specific to those chapters. 
Um, in chapter six, you, you say we have two green out of four, out of four topics, you have two green and two yellow. Um, in chapter six, take a look at the causes of variation. Um, look at common causes of variation and assignable causes of variation. Uh, review the concept of Six Sigma. This course does not dive in very deep into the idea of Six Sigma, but provides a very surface level of Six Sigma because Six Sigma is crucial to statistical quality control. It falls under the concept of um, process capability, helps an organization determine uh, the capability of its process. Um, understand also the meaning of process capability, just what process capability is, and the process capability index, okay? Um, I want to talk on the process capability index for a minute because one of the things I want to ensure that you avoid is process capability index. If you get too deep in it, it has a lot to do with statistics and calculations and formulas and so on and so forth. So for the purpose of this assessment, even though those things are outlined and discussed in the textbook, your, the exam does not test you on the statistical calculation components of this concept. They simply want you to know what process capability index calculates. All right, it is the average. It calculates the average to determine whether the process is capable of doing what it does. So it's a measurement of process capability. And that's what you really need to know about that. So here are some of the key topics. We're providing this for this presentation as notes. This file is also available in course tips that you can look at and help have all that information and notes at your fingertips as well. So you have the seven quality management tools. Um, you have cause and effect diagrams, the flow chart, checklist, control chart, scatter diagram, Pareto analysis, and histogram. So make sure you understand what each of those are and what management use those for. For example, a Pareto analysis is a technique used to identify quality problems based on the degree of importance. The logic behind Pareto analysis is that only a few quality problems are important, whereas many others are not critical. So if you see anything has any question on the exam that has to do with, well, there is that even out, is this important or is this less important? Then you know something with the degree of importance has to do with Pareto analysis. So pay very close attention to those several seven quality control tools. Um, and we talk about the quality gurus and their contributions. Make sure you know those things. What was what was Dr. Demin's um, contribution? He said he stressed management responsible for quality, for example. What was um, Armand's contribution to TQM, the concept of TQM? He introduced the concept of total quality control, which is what we're looking at in chapter four and chapter six, and chapter five rather, and chapter six. Who coined the phrase quality is free? Philip Crosby did that. So make sure you understand and know those things. And then concept of TQM philosophy, um, you have the concept and the main idea. And that's what I was talking about a while ago when I talk about the use of quality tools, ongoing employee training in the use of quality tools. Don't just know that, but know what those quality tools are. What is process management? What does what the concept of customer focus mean? The goal is to identify and meet customer needs, but be sure that you are reviewing the description of those concepts in your text. All right. Um, common causes of variation, assignable causes of variation. What those two things are, process capability. Be sure to understand what that is, as well as the meaning of process capability index. It's an index or a mean used to measure process capability. It's computed as the ratio of the specification width to the width of the process variability. You know this, it's really calculating a mean, finding the middle ground. All right. And then for Six Sigma, understand the, 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 uh, the five steps in Six Sigma, that is define, measure, analyze, improve, control. You may be required to put those in order. You may be required to know which step of, of the 
the Six Sigma uh, this one is. So if we say improve the process by eliminating the root cause of the problem, what step of the Six Sigma plan is this? This is step number four, so on and so forth. All right, so make sure you understand and know those things. All right, competency number two, capacity planning and location analysis. Um, the objective of this competency, the graduate designs capacity, process, layout, and location strategies. Chapters for this, for this um, competency are chapter three, nine, and 10. Now, my recommendation is to study this, this competency in that order, nine, three, and 10, or chapter nine, 10, and three. Uh, the reason is because chapter nine addresses capacity planning location analysis, which is the competency itself. Chapter three deals with process selection and chapter 10 deals with facility layouts. All right, so you can study it in that um, component. Then, um, now check this out. This competency makes up 26% of the assessment. So if we calculate out of 70 questions, that is roughly about 18 questions. So essentially on that competency, you might receive, you might see 18 questions. That's a lot of questions. That simply tells you we need to know some things for that chapter. Before we dive into that, let's break down the chapters first. Chapter nine deals with capacity planning right and location analysis in chapter nine you will find those concepts decline this describe what is capacity planning it talks about um, effective capacity design capacity understand capacity and capacity decisions and so forth in chapter 10 we talk about discusses facility layout all right facility layout really has to do with how something looks all right um, so for instance, let me give you an example. Um, I own my house. I have a two-story house, all right? You come to my house, open the door, and then you don't just enter into my kitchen, right? There is this entrance, and then to your right, there is my first dining room or my first living room, and to a further right, there is uh, what we call a formal dining room, right? To your left, there are three doors, one that goes to my garage, one goes to my closet, and one goes to my laundry. From the door, you can see my living room. If you enter, walk in and go to my living room to your right, there will be my nook, and then the kitchen is right there. That's how the floor is laid out. We can think of layout in terms of blueprint. Right. If you look at if you if you've owned a house before and you see a blueprint, this is the blueprint of my house. Another thing to think of, think of when you walk into your your doctor's office. Right. Who do you walk? What do you walk into? You enter the door and here are the rest receptionists. They might greet you. Hello. Think of when you go to a, a grocery store. All right. This is how this is what we mean by facility layout, the place that you work. Think of how the whole floor is laid out. Where are your managers seated? Where are you seated? Who do you see when you walk into the building? All right, think of when you go to a hotel, when you walk into that front door and that's, that double door opens up for you, that automatic double door opens up for you. Who do you see? The receptionist, right? So think of it in that way. You don't just walk straight into your hotel room, right? You have to walk into the city. That's what we mean by facility layout. And something to pay attention to is the word facility is really, you know, these are old terms, essentially. These are terms that have to do with manufacturing in the good old days, right? Um, so you hear things like enterprise and, and facility. You don't hear stuff like building anymore, right? So back in the day in the Industrial Revolution, that had to do with how these facilities or buildings or warehouses or places as we know them today were laid out, office layout, um, even your home layout, right? Um, you buy a car and they tell you, look at how this is laid out. Look at how the dashboard is laid out and the seats are all laid out. 
That's really what that entails. So think of it in that perspective. So that will help create good perspective for you when you look at things like different types of layout, process layout, fixed layout, hybrid layout, uh, product layout. When you look at those things in chapter 10, it will, the term layout oh, just comes up to you like, oh, this is how it looks, all right? Um, and then in chapter three, we talk about process selection. So you have capacity planning, location analysis. A company has to decide where it wants to do its business. In business, one of the things we hear a lot of is the term location, location, location. That is very important for any and every business. Uh, a person graduate from, from law school, they pass the law, the bar, they just go start a, a, a law firm anyway, right? That individual has to make a very um, detailed, elaborative just, um, um, analysis of where to open a law firm. Um, you don't just see Starbucks coffee every and anywhere. They are specifically and strategically located. This is crucial, right? Um, and so based on what an organization does or what type of business a company does, it is important to understand the company's process. And that's where the idea of process selection comes into play. So does my company do a process that requires or do, when you hear the term process, it simply means what the company is doing. We're serving coffee, right? We're printing um, paper. We, are, we, we package paper. That's, that's a process. That's really what we are doing. But on top of that, how the company is doing it. So it's what the company does and how it's doing it. Kind of like you have a process of how you do things. You wake up in the morning, this is how your morning goes, get ready for work and you go to work. You know, some people say, hey, don't mess with my desk. My desk is organized in a certain way. That's my process. That's how I do, how I'm doing things. So based on that process of what the organization does, what type of business it does, um, what type of service it provides, for example, then there are repetitive processes and there are intermittent of, um, processes. Some of us say that word differently, intermittent. Some people, to me, everybody I've heard kind of pronounces that word um, differently, but I say intermittent, all right? Um, so there are repetitive processes and intermittent processes. So it depends on what the organization does. It might incorporate both of those. Let me give you an example um, of intermittent and why we have this topic. Um, I think of this oftentimes. I take my kids, my, um, my kids to see their pediatrician, okay? I walk into the office and then somebody behind a glass window says hello to me. And then they ask me who, who is here? I tell them the name of my child. They have all the documents already ready because they know what time is the appointment. And then they might ask me to sign some document or look over some stuff. They might ask me for an insurance card or well, however that goes. It just depends, right? And then they, the next thing, the last thing they will tell me after all of this or none of this will be, someone will be with you in a little while, okay? So I wait 15, sometimes 10 minutes, five minutes. It just depends, right? Somebody comes in and they call the child name. John Doe, right? You get up and you say, John, come on. And then you walk with that person. They take you to a small room. That CNA, that nurse, or whoever that is, that they actually take you through a whole process of putting the cuffs on the child, get on the scale, find out some height. They ask specific questions and they have that little notepad and take notes. Sometimes it depends what company it is. They might have. Uh, computer all right so that in its sense that little piece when the nurse comes and calls and take that child to that room that may be considered a repetitive process because in that little room or triage that individual is doing the same thing with every patient that would be considered a repetitive process because they're doing the same thing with every patient oftentimes even ask the same questions once that child leaves that room and goes to the to the room number three, that's a different process. All right, that would be considered. What happens in that room would be considered an intermittent process because that doctor, when he or she comes in, is going to attend to that in child 
specific to that child's need. So if this is a regular checkup, then he, he or she does that regular checkup. If it's, oh, the child has a rash and I just bring, her, I bring the child in to check on her, then everything that happens is going to be specific, customized, designed for that child based on their need. All right, kind of get ahead of ourselves on that one, but I just wanted to create some perspective on here. So things to know, chapter three, how to use a process flowchart how to use process performance metrics. You see those are yellow. The types of operational processes and their characteristics. So make sure you understand those. In chapter nine, decision support tools used in capacity planning, decision support tools used in location analysis. Make sure you know those things. These topics are outlined in your text. The challenges of capacity planning in a hospital setting, and the capacity planning and location across all, organ, across all the organization. In chapter nine, we have a read, steps involved in capacity planning and location analysis. Make sure you know those steps, one, two, three. Um, key factors in location analysis, select an ideal location for a service company. In chapter 10, guess where we have? We got some problems in chapter 10. We have a read the different types of layout. I will, I will employ you, understand a fixed layout, a construction site is a fixed layout. If a company is building a bridge, that's a fixed layout. If, a, if you're building a house, that's a fixed layout. Understand the difference between process layout and product layout. And then steps involved in designing a process layout. So here are some good notes to understand and to pay close attention to. A process flow chart, process performance metric, what metrics, what does it measure? Understand intermittent operations and repetitive operations. This chart the picture was taken directly from your text. Look at the two things that fall under repetitive operations or the two types of processes and the two types of processes that fall under intermittent operations. Look at the examples. For example, batch process, education classes, a bakery, a printing shop. Look at line processes like an assembly line, a cafeteria, an oil refinery, and a water treatment plant. These are considered continuous processes. So make sure you know those things. Um, one of the things, I, I, I do not implore uh, memorization for this course because there's so much material. But I generally recommend to memorize the process matrix performance metrics, because most of your questions from that are going to be, if I know that, then I know what it is. So if you know the definition and you know the measure and the, the formula, then you will be able to answer questions on those. Let me hit a, highlight something real quick. The formulas that are outlined here for the pro performance metrics, you're not going to get formula slash calculation questions. All right, you might see something like, what is the average amount of time product takes to move through the system, right? And then they'll give you formulas for it, all right? A measure of how well a company uses its resources, time of resources used versus time of resources available, actual output versus standard output, and output versus input. The answer is output versus divided by input. All right, understand the differences between intermittent operations and repetitive operations. Once again, these are taken directly from your textbook. Um, remember the three steps or the three step procedure for making capacity planning decision. Know those three steps, all right? Understand the idea of decision trees because these are used in um, location decisions. When a company is making the location decision, they are using decision trees to make those decisions. Factors affecting location decisions. Make sure you know those. Some of those are applicable to manufacturing companies. Some are applicable to um, service companies. And, and then understand the procedure for making location decisions. There are three steps. Um, and there are three steps also in designing process layout, gather information, develop a block plan, develop a detailed layout. Look at how those topics are explained in the text as well. Then the big one, the types of layout. Here is this table, 
the characteristics of, pro of process and product layout. Make sure you can differentiate between the two. For example, product layout, resources used as specialized, whereas in process layout, resources are for general purpose. All right, now I wanna to jump to the last one. In process layout, there are higher space requirements. In product layout, there are lower space requirements. All right, so make sure you know those things. Let's move on. Three, this is our third competency, work system design and scheduling. The objective here, graduate utilizes process and methods analysis, measurement techniques and scheduling concepts to design the work system, okay? Um, on that note, I will give you some link at the end that shows you different uh, videos that we have in the course, in course tips or in the classroom. There is a video that really talks about work system design. I really admonish you to pay attention to that and take a listen to that as well. So chapter competency three covers chapter 11, which deals with work system design and a section of chapter 15 that deals with um, scheduling. It makes up 9% of the assessment, which is approximately six questions out of 70 questions. This is an area that a lot of students find some difficulties. In chapter 11, the difficulties falls on the work measurement. That is to estimate time to complete a specific job. Students are doing well on the steps involved in methods analysis and how to design a work system. These are topics to look at in chapter three. Um, 11, sorry. So there is a lot to study in chapter 11, but there is very, there are very few questions that come from that. And in chapter 15, you have to understand the differences between infinite and finite loading for scheduling work. We also created a short video that discusses infinite loading and finite loading, along with backward scheduling and finite scheduling. You can find those links in course tips. I ask that you pay attention to those as well. All right, um, so here are some things to look at from the text, work measurement, talk about standard time, machines versus people, when an organization should use machine versus when people should be used. Um, there is the concept of job design, a question, a topic that is very hard, um, that is very much tested in, chap in um, your work system design piece. Understand technical feasibility, economic feasibility, behavioral feasibility. Make sure you understand the difference between three of those and be able to identify which one relates for. So for example, behavioral feasibility of a job is the degree to which an employee derives intrinsic satisfaction from doing the job, right? The person has intrinsic satisfaction in comparison to economic, all right? And understand methods analysis. The steps in methods analysis, forward scheduling, backward scheduling, what is infinite loading and what is finite loading. Next, <clears throat> we move on to, oh, operating system. I need to get my spelling corrected on that one, don't I? Um, so operating system, the competency objective, the graduate employs just in time and lean systems to improve operating efficiency. The chapter covers, the chapter covered our chapter seven, and a section of chapter 15. This makes up 11% of the assessment, which runs at approximately eight questions. Now, I said that I'm using the word approximately because we as your instructors, the honest truth is we don't know what questions are on the objective assessment. But based on our continuous conversation to students, we ask questions, they present information to us. This is sort of what we are seeing, something very similar to the pre-assessment as well. So chapter seven deals with the just-in-time philosophy concept. This is just something, if you understand what just-in-time is, then everything fall in place. Most of us use that term. Man, you call me just-in-time. Man, I made it to work just-in-time or right on time, right? That's really what it is. Right time, right product, right quality. A, co a company wants to be efficient, it's important to have the right product and do, the, do it right on time and then deliver to the customer and customer satisfied, all right? And in chapter 15, we look more at a different concept of constraints management.
All right, so topics to know from chapter seven, the core elements of just-in-time system, the impact of just-in-time across the organization. You notice that this is a little area of struggle for students. Understand the relationship between just-in-time and lean systems and the differences between push and pull production system. Now, um, just a, a note that, you know, just kind of piggyback from what students have told us, some students have reported that they have questions about push and pull where they have to um, identify, which is kind of like a matching question, which is a pull example, which is a push example. When you think of push and pull, just think of situation that's a proactive versus situations that are reactive. A push process means you push yourself ahead, you being proactive. A pull process means you pulling yourself out. Okay, you being reactive. A customer places an order, when company gets the order, they react to the order, right? To the order. All right. Push is a company doesn't just wait for the order, they prepare it ahead of time. When the order comes, they push it out. It's gone. All right. So look for examples that's showing either a react something is a reaction or something is a pro action. Something is done ahead of time. For example, and we talk about that in one of our videos too. If you go to a restaurant such as Red Lobster, they take your drink order, the, the um, waiter or waitress brings your order, and they also bring you um, a, a bag of rolls or biscuits, right? Um, Red Lobster serves those nice biscuits. That would be pushed. The, the, the biscuits were prepared way before you came, so we'd come, they heat it up, and then bring it on your table. Push, all right? Pool is you place your order and she says, all right, I'll take it to the kitchen and then the cook will prepare your food, bring it to your table hot. That's pool. The food is prepared when you ordered from your waitress and your waitress brings the order to the table. All right, just putting things in perspective. And in chapter 15, constraint management. All right, so understand again, just-in-time philosophy. Remember the concept of just-in-time is really about waste elimination. It's really about waste. When we think of waste elimination, we have to think of it in terms of inventory. All right. Is remember, this is about production. Are we going to produce? Think about this. If you were a nurse working at a hospital and there is an empty room with no patient, do you have an IV running on that, on that pole while there is no patient in the room? No. You only set up the IV when a patient comes and the patient needs the IV. But you already have the IV back. So you go to wherever it's stored and you get it, and then you come and set up that IV. That's your that's you, that's a push, that's a pool process, right? You only set up the IV when the patient needs it. Guess what? Not every patient that comes to a room needs an IV. So if that patient does not need an IV, you don't run an IV on them, right? You might have a water bag hanging on the pole. Right, it's just hanging there just in case. That's your push. You have it there just in case. So when that person comes, your pull reaction is to plug it in, put the thing through their arm, and then run it through. Hey, just quick information here. Pull and push system. All right, Kanban. Understand Kanban. I have students that are saying they get questions about Kanban, and they're like, I don't even know what that is. Kanban is just a signal, just a signal. That's all it is. Think of this with me real quick. All right, nurses, if you are a nurse listening to this, um, let's think about this. You run an IV in patient John Doe in room number five, right? The IV is going to run, that bag is going to empty up. When that bag empties, you hear beep, 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 beep. That's your signal that you either need to end that IV because it was only one bag or you need to go change the patient's IV. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right, Kanban is just a signal in the process that says something needs to happen. So if we put it in production, it's really about a company gets a signal that says, hey, here is an order, produce it. All right, so make sure you understand those things. From chapter 15, theories of constraint, we talk about internal resource constraint, market constraint, philosophy, policy constraint. Make sure you understand those things and understand this procedure and using theory of constraint, the different steps in that. Just uh, review that from chapter 15 and you should be good. 
All right, we got two more, and so we got to get going. Um, uh, competency number five, supply chain management, one chapter, that's chapter four. The competency objective is the graduate understands or organizes the supply chain to create a competitive advantage for any organization. This exam does not test you so much on supply chain management because you actually can take supply chain management as a degree or as a course by itself. So there is just a very highlighted component of what supply chain management is. So this is from chapter four and comprises 11% of the assessment, uh, which as we said before, runs at about eight questions. So guess what? There is only one area that students are struggling in a little bit in supply chain management. So generally speaking, students generally do very well on that competency. But here are things to know, all right? The components of a supply chain, understand those three components, internal resources, external distribution, external suppliers, all right? Make sure you understand internal suppliers. Make sure you understand those three components. How to implement supply chain management, supply chain management metrics, all those topics are in your text. When does a company use insourcing versus when does a company use outsourcing? The important thing to know about that is just understand what is insourcing. Everything is done within the organization. Outsourcing, everything is done outside the organization. Outsourcing is generally done when a company just kind of, we don't have what it takes to do this. So let's find somebody to do it. In sourcing, everything is in control. So let me give a quick example. Um, if you are a mother, you are a child, or parent, you are a child, you have to go to work, um, there's nobody to look at your child, you're going to outsource that child to the daycare or childcare facility while you're at work, right? When you get from work, you go to the childcare facility, pick up your child, come home. You don't need that help anymore. So it's in source to you when everything is okay, you're out of work, you're home, you don't need help, you're good. When you have something else to do, you have other things to do, you have to go to work, for example, you send that child to outsource and you pay for the outsource, right? So, and then last thing, um, difference between vertical and horizontal integration. Horizontal integration really has to do with more mergers and acquisition. Two companies doing the same business, they merge together or one acquires the other. For example, T-Mobile and Sprint, a bank buys a bank. Two hospitals merge together. That's a horizontal integration. Vertical integration is about an, um, an organization going back into its supply chain and more than likely buying out one of its supply of its supplies or going into the commercial or the retail um, market and then setting up shop in the retail market. So for example, Amazon sets up a retail store at the mall. That's a vertical integration. They want a part of the retail industry as well. All right, so topics to know, again, components of a supply chain for a manufacturer, external suppliers has to do with tier one, tier two, tier three um, <clears throat> suppliers. Um, understand the difference between external suppliers, internal functions and external distributors. There is an example of a diary of a, of a dairy product supply chain in your text. Make sure you understand each of those components of that as well. So we have implementing the supply chain. There are five steps. Understand from your text, insourcing versus outsourcing, right? See where those falls into play. And sourcing decisions, we talk about um, Vertical integration, in-source processes, outsource processes, backward integration, forward integration. I do have also another short video in Course Tips that talks about um, integration in the supply chain as well. So pay close attention to that. All right. And then last but not least, we come to the to the heaviest one, and hopefully we can wrap this up in a couple of minutes. So our final competency is management and planning. The competency objective, the graduate applies operations and inventory management requirements and concepts to achieve operating objectives. There are four chapters that this competency covers. Chapter 12, inventory management. Chapter 13, 
aggregate planning, 14 resource planning, and 16 project management. It makes up 27% of the assessment, which is the highest, and that's roughly around 19, 20 questions. So most of your questions are going to be um, on there. One of the things I'm beginning to realize about the objective assessment is that your questions follow that competency pattern. Competency one, two, three, four, five. So apparently the last set of questions on the exam are going to cover the, upper, the uh, management and planning competency. So let's say 19 out of 70 runs us about what? Question 51. So roughly from question 51, you're going to get questions on the management and planning um, section. In another video at some point in time, um, we talk about test taking tips. We have an introduction video in the course that talks about that. I would say look at that video as well and learn some good strategy in managing your, your, your test taking skills. All right, so you would definitely believe that this is also a bit of a challenge to several students. So here are some things to know from chapter 12, how inventory management differs from manufacturing, retail and service industries, methods used to verify inventory, the objectives of inventory management. So there is not too much covered in chapter 12. In chapter 13, we have one yellow, the various functional areas of sales and operations in planning processes. Then there is the effectiveness of an existing aggregate plan. Know the three aggregate planning strategies, chase, level, and hybrid, and the process of developing an aggregate plan. All right, chapter 14 is kind of where we see a bit of a headache, right? Um, we have the benefits and costs of enterprise resource planning, the objectives of material requirements planning, or MRP, and the role of capacity requirements planning, and the, difference, the different types of demand. So... Um, we need to kind of switch up something here. So we have the objectives of MRP, the role of CRP, the cost and benefits of ERP, and the different types of demand. This is a bit of a challenge to several students. So what we've done, there is a series of, th of three short videos that addresses the benefits and cost of ERP, the objectives of MRP, and the third video covers the role of CRP. All right, those three video links are available in course tips. Check them out. I will show you all those links um, in a little while. And then the last thing is the different types of demand. Understand independent demand and dependent demand. I always look at dependent demand and independent from that perspective. A child from zero years to 17 years and 11 months is dependent on their parent. When the child turned 18, legally, the, the, the law says this child is an independent child. They do not need to depend on their parents for anything. They can go out and enjoy their life. As good parents, we will take care of our children because they're always our children. But if we just look at it simply from a legal perspective, that child is now independent. They do not need you as a parent to survive. How do I put that in? Um, production terms. Well, a product does not need anything to be a fulfilled product for it to work. You go to the store, you buy a computer, plug it in, it's working. All right, it's good. You buy a fridge, everything it has, you plug it in, put your groceries in or your stuff in and it's working. A dependent product simply means that you cannot go to the car dealership and buy a car and there's no tires. You cannot buy a car. The car is not going to go anywhere if there's no gas in the tank. The car is depending on gas to work. All right, so just talking to the same. In chapter 16, as you can notice, you only have to know the project life cycle. That's really good. All right, so understand methods to verify inventory from chapter 12, periodic counting, cycle counting, understand the steps that are involved in that as well. Know the idea of how inventory management differs from manufacturing, retail, and servicing industry. There's a good bit of information on that in your text. All right. Um, service industries use relevant inventory. I'm just saying that right there. All right. Services industries, servicing industries use or companies use relevant inventory costs. All right. Effectiveness of aggregate plan. Make sure you know those. Remember, it's next it, from 10 to 2 to 10 years, right? Sales and operations, 
um, planning. Make sure you understand that marketing plan, the three levels of strategies, chase, hybrid, and level. Make sure you understand each of those. Enterprise resource planning, we outline the benefits of ERP and the cost of ERP. Make sure you understand and know those benefits, especially tangible benefits and intangible benefits and understand the cost. ERP system, this is the system that runs your company. I applaud you to please check out those short videos in course tips that covers those topics. All right, objectives of MRP, our text identify two objectives. Make sure you know those objectives. Determine the quantity and timing of material and maintain um, priorities. And lastly, the role of CRP. Make sure you understand that ERP checks that enough work is scheduled for in operations and check that the amount of work is feasible. In ERP capacity requirements planning, we talk about loading the workstation, all right? When we think of loading the workstation, we think of labor in, in production. We're not only thinking about people. We're also thinking of equipment. So, for example, I'm going to give you a, a, a healthcare example, okay? Um, a patient is sick at the hospital. There are nurses assigned to that patient. That's labor. There are also specific equipments that are assigned to that patient as well. This falls on the capacity, the capacity that's required, the labor that's required, the machines that are required for that patient to be taken care of. Materials would be your gloves, the bed is the sheets on the bed, all those things, these would be your material, your shots, right? You bring the IV out and all of that stuff. That would be your material, okay? Your equipment, your bed would be considered part of your capacity because that patient has to have a bed. I've been to the hospital where they said, okay, you guys are gonna have to wait for a little while because we're waiting to get a bed into that room. That's capacity, that's required because that falls, the, the, this workstation is not loaded or this room is empty because there is no bed in there, all right? And then nurses and doctors are assigned to that person. So check out the video in course tips on that as well. Types of demand, independent demand, dependent demand, make sure you understand that and make sure you know, last but not least, make sure you know the project life cycle phases. Be able to put those in order. One, two, three, four, five. Be able to put them in order, but be sure also to know what each of those represent. Okay? Know when it's concept. If it's an idea, nothing is being done. It's just an idea we talk about. That's conception. Understand when the execution is and the termination. So make sure you know the project life cycle. All right. So course content videos. These are all videos and video links that are available to you in course tips. So I am putting those on here um, so you guys can see what's available to you in course tips. So there are videos on total quality management. We have two links in here. There are videos on capacity planning, location analysis, product layout, process layout, work system design, scheduling, finite loading, infinite loading, operating efficiency, just in time and lean system. There are videos on supply chain management, also an additional video on supply chain. There is a third video on vertical integration in the supply chain. There is a video on management and planning. There is also one on aggregate planning. There is also another video on resource planning. And these are the video series I was referring to on material requirements planning, enterprise requirements planning, and capacity requirements planning. So all these resources, video links are available for you in course tips. Take a listen to those as well. All right, so for the reference of this text, we for the reference of the information that we use for this discussion, we use your textbook, which is the, the Operations Management 70 edition, seventh edition by Reed and Sanders. This is the required textbook for this course. So while we wrap up, you got questions, you got concerns, you got anything you want to be clarified about this course and things you need to, to know, 
contact your course instructor. All right. Um, we have Dr. Joseph, myself. Um, here's my email address and Dr. Goldston. We may be adding at the time of this video, we may be adding another instructor to the course. So that will come in later on. Or you can simply email us at operations. Uh, um, operations or operations at wgu.edu. I got to make my corrections there as well. So you can email us at oper uh, operations at wgu. Dot edu, not operations dot wg, but operations at wgu dot edu. I hope this has been very helpful to you and very informative, and I wish you the best in your review and in passing this objective assessment. Good luck, everybody, and stay safe at all times and enjoy learning. It's good. Thank you.